this paper at the International Symposium on Communication Systems, Networks, and Digital Signal Processing held last July 2018 at the, uh, in, the, in Budapest, Hungary. So here's the outline of my presentation. First, I'll discuss the motivation as to why we need to design new waveforms and multiple access strategies that can meet the requirements of the next generation mobile technology or 5G. Next, I'll present the system model of the proposed multi-user uh, multi transmission scheme, which essentially combines sparse code multiple access and spectrally efficient frequency division multiplexing. So the details of these two transmission techniques will be discussed later in my lecture. And then third, I'll discuss the results of my simulation. And then finally, I'll wrap up my presentation by delivering a summary of my work and research contributions. Okay, so to start, uh, the primary goal of this work is to develop new transmission schemes that can help meet the requirements of 5G. It is expected that 5G will be able to handle a lot more traffic data through its enhanced mobile broadband connectivity, as well as to support the networking needs of massive Internet of Things or IoT. Now, aside from these two use cases, it is also expected that 5G will be able to provide ultra-reliable and low-latency communications to support the needs of uh, mission-critical and time-sensitive applications such as factory automation, autonomous driving, and, ve and vehicular networks. Now, in, uh, in the initial, uh, initial phase of 5G new radio specifications, which is release, 5, uh, release 15, only the enhanced mobile broadband use case and some aspects of the low latency communications have been support, uh, was, were supported. But it is expected that the future releases of 5G new radio specifications will be able to support all these three use cases. And the road to achieving all these performance targets is to combine multiple solutions in the air interface and network architecture of the cellular network. And the focus of this research is on the improve, improving the air interface technology of the cellular network, uh, particularly the multiple access uh, component and the RF waveform used for over-the-air transmission. Okay. So first is the multiple access technique. So current cellular systems use Orthogonal, uh, orthogonal multiple access techniques or OMA. The principle behind OMA is that uh, each, each channel resource is assigned at most one user so that they won't interfere, their transmissions won't interfere with one another. So a depiction of orthogonal multiple access is shown here in the lower, uh, lower left where in each color means there are different users. As, as you can see here, the x-axis is the channel resource. It can be either time, frequency, or code. And the y-axis is the power allocated to that uh, channel resource. As, as we can see here, there are uh, for each channel resource, there is only one user so that they won't interfere with one another. And this OMA has been proven to be useful since it was used in previous uh, in previous and current cellular technologies such as GSM, UMTS, and LTE. So for example, for GSM, they use time division multiple access coupled with frequency division duplex. For 3G or UMTS, they use uh, wideband code division multiple access. And for 4G, long, uh, 4G LTE, they use orthogonal frequency division multiple access for the downlink transmission of the base station. Okay, so, however, the, a major drawback of using orthogonal multiple access is that it limits uh, the number of users that can be admitted by the or serviced by the network is limited by the number of available resources. And this won't be helpful if we consider the massive machine type communication use case of 5G. So in order to overcome this problem, researchers are considering the use of non-orthogonal multiple access schemes or NOMA. So essentially NOMA can provide significant improvements in the system capacity 
by allowing multiple users to use the uh, same resource allocation. And the use of NOMA, uh, a depiction of NOMA can be seen in the lower right figure. So we can see for this particular channel resource, we can see that multiple users share this resource. Now the problem with this is that since they are using the same channel, res uh, channel resource, they will their transmissions will interfere. However, we can apply interference cancellation techniques at the receiver side in order to remove or at least minimize the effect of this inter-user interference. And then for the RF waveform part, so the 4G, uh, 4G LTE uses orthogonal frequency division multiplexing or OFDM for its downlink transmission. And the idea behind OFDM is that is to make the frequencies of carriers overlap in such a way that they won't interfere with one another. So for example, if I try to decode this orange subcarrier, so I try to decode the data carried by the subcarrier, notice that if I draw a line from this point going to this point, the contributions of other subcarriers are zero. So in essence, they do not, although they overlap, they do not interfere with one another. And since they since we are able to overlap the subcarriers, there are no guard, uh, guard bands. We can say that OFDM is spectral, uh, achieves high, has high spectral efficiency. However, we can further improve the spectral efficiency of OFDM by further compressing the subcarrier. So if we try to reduce the distance, uh, the frequency separations in between subcarriers, then we can reduce the Bandwidth. And recall that spectral efficiency is given by data rate over bandwidth. And if we use the same date, uh, if you use the same data rate for each subcarriers, but we reduce the overall bandwidth, then this is fixed, this is reduced, then the overall spectral efficiency is increased. Okay. Now, although it seems that spectral efficient OFD, uh, spectral efficient FD, uh, FDM improves the spectral effic efficiency. A major drawback of this is that the orthogonality property between subcarriers are uh, is violated. So, for example, again, if I try to decode the data from this orange subcarrier, what will happen if I draw a line from this point to this point? We can see that the contributions of other subcarriers are non-zero, and hence there will be an intercarrier. Interference. However, we can apply signal processing techniques, which, will, which I will discuss later, to remove the intercarrier interference in between these subcarriers. Okay. Now, since we are able to reduce the bandwidth used by our bandwidth used in our transmission, then we we can actually use this saved bandwidth to transmit redundant data. And hence, if we are able to transmit redundant information, we can increase the reliability of this transmission. So what will happen is we will try to, we will use the safe bandwidth for transmitting redundant data. So its spectral efficiency is still the same as with OFDM, but we were able to remove both the intercarrier interference as well as provide some error correction technique to the uh, transmission. So that's the idea behind uh, what we call pre-coded SEF DM. Okay. So my research objectives here are as follows. So first, I implemented a multi-user transmission scheme that combines non-orthogonal multi-carrier signaling. This is the case. Uh, this is the SEF DM with a non-orthogonal multiple access. Specifically, a a variant of non-orthogonal multiple access called sparse code multiple access was integrated with pre-coded spectrally efficient frequency division multiplexing. And then the, perf the error performance of this uh, multi-user transmission scheme was investigated over a EWG and channel and for different system parameters. So I varied different system parameters such as the bandwidth compression factor and decoding iterations of the receiver. And I'll explain later what these two means as I discuss my methodology. Okay. So here's the overview of the proposed transmission scheme. First, the data of each user is fed to an SEMA encoder, and the SEMA encoder 
maps the user data to a subset of the available frequency resource. And then the aggregated S output of the combined output of the SEMA encoder is fed to a pre-coded SEFDM modulator, which performs pre-coding operation, operation and bandwidth compressed multi-carrier transmission. So the output here will be fed to a communication channel, which for our case, we, will con we only considered first uh, AWGN. And then the received symbol will be processed by the pre-coded SEFDM and the SEMA decoder. And the, the objective of the uh, pre-coded SEFDM demodulator is to invert the operations done in the pre-coded SEFDM modulator. And likewise, uh, well, for the SEMA decoder, we try to recover the original transmitted bits from the recovered SEMA symbols via the, uh, this one is message passing algorithm. So we expect here that the output of the SEMA decoders will be estimated uh, bit streams for each user. Okay. So for the succeeding slides, I'll explain the the system uh, detailed system implementation. So we first consider an SEMA group catering to J users, so they are, there are J users and likewise there are J SEMA encoder. And an SEMA group is composed of, uh, uh, the J SEMA encoders maps the bits of the J users to N frequency subcarriers, where J should be greater than N, meaning the number of users should be greater than the number of available frequency resource. And since we impose this requirement that J should be greater than N, we will expect that for each frequency resource, there will be multiple users using it. But since due to the sparse structure of SCMA, we will be able to recover the, the, we will be able to efficiently recover the signals for each user at the receiver side. And then next, once we've, uh, so after the SEMA encoding, so we will uh, we will have uh, L SEMA groups, group one up to group L, and then we will concatenate the output. So the output, uh, the output of one SEMA group will be n. This is the number of frequency resources. Then since there are n groups, so the output of this block will be a n by a uh, n l by one vector s. Then we will pad zero such that we can transform the dimensions of this input to n prime by n, where n prime is given by this formula. So floor of n l over alpha, where alpha here is the bandwidth compression factor, which I'll explain later. Okay. And then next is I'll, uh, we will feed the output of the zero padding block to the precoder and the, the Objective of the precoder is to perform matrix vector operation. So it will multiply a matrix, a unitary matrix U to the output of this, up to the input of the precoder block, then we will get this S bar. So the design of this U, this unitary matrix U will be discussed later. Okay. And then the output, the, this vector S bar will be fed to the SEFDM modulator and the, per the operation done by this SEFDM modulator is matrix vector multiplication of this matrix F, which is a Q by N prime. Q is the oversampling factor. Uh, uh, sorry, Q is equal to rho N prime, where rho is the oversampling factor. And then uh, we'll be able to get the transmitted sequence. Now, this matrix F, okay, the values the elements of this matrix F is denoted by this expression. So the kth row and the nth row column of this matrix F is given by this expression, 1 over square root of Q times e to the j2 pi n k alpha over Q. Now this has some similarities with the, uh, with the I in inverse discrete Fourier transform formula with the addition of this parameter. Alpha. This alpha denotes the bandwidth compression factor, which which uh, controls the separation of the subcarrier. So this alpha ranges from zero to one. A value of zero for alpha means that 
the subcalers perfectly overlap and uh, value of alpha means that they are orthogonal. So this will boil down to an inverse discrete Fourier transform. So this will be just OFDM. So we can say that OFDM is actually a special case of SEFDM where alpha is equal to one. And then next, for the receiver side, uh, after passing the transmitter output through the channel, the receiver sim uh, the receive symbol vector uh, Y is processed by the SEFDM demodulator and postmotor block. So the, the goal of the demodulator block and the postmotor block is to uh, invert the operations of the modulator and the precoder block respectively. Okay? So for the SEFDM demodulator, we perform matrix multiplication of uh, Hermitian transpose of F denoted by this F star. And then the postcoder operation performs matrix vector operation of uh, Hermitian conjugate of U denoted by this U star. Okay, then we will get output of the pre-coded SEF. And then we will divide the output here into L, uh, to L SEMA groups. And then we will apply log-based message passing algorithm. We'll discuss the purpose of message passing algorithm later. And then the output of this message passing algorithm will be the bits of the users in each uh, SEM. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we need to, uh, going back to the uh, pre-coding and post-coding, uh, design of the pre-coding and post-coding uh, matrices. So the goal is to design the post-coder and pre-coding uh, pre and post-coder such that the intercarrier's interference is removed. Okay? So why is the expression for the intercarrier interference or ICI can be obtained by getting the correlation matrix uh, C, which is equal to F star times F. So we can think of this as the cascade, opera, uh, cascade of the SEFDM block and uh, SEFDM modulator and SEFDM demodulator, this multiplication of F star F. And then to remove the inter-user, uh, inter-carrier interference, we can apply eigenvalue decomposition to this correlation matrix. So this C can be decomposed into three matrices, U, then this capital lambda, which, the, which contains the eigenvalues of the correlation matrix, and this uni, uh, uni, also unitary matrix U star. So this U is a, contains actually the eigenvectors that, uh, of, co that corresponds to the eigenvalue contained, uh, eigenvalues contained by this lambda uh, variable. Okay. And then in order to remove the effects of correlation matrix, so what we did again was we apply post-coding and pre-coding. So essentially, when we try to write out the mathematical expression for the pre-coding and post-coding operation, we're just multiplying at the left of the correlation matrix, the matrix U, that's the pre-coding operation. Ah, sorry, this is the right, uh, right multiplication of the pre-coding matrix U, and then left multiplication of the post-coding matrix U star. And since, U's, uh, and since U is unitary, so U star times U will be an identity matrix. And then U, I'm uh, sorry, U star times U will be an, also an identity matrix. So we're left with this lambda. And take note that this lambda, uh, the diagonal elements of this lambda is the, are the eigenvalues. And the off diagonals should be zero. And since the off diagonals are zero, there are no intercarrier interference. Okay. And then, Next is for the message passing algorithm. Um, for the message passing algorithm, we built a factor graph by assigning the frequency resources as function nodes and the users as value nodes. Okay? And then what we will do here is for n sub iter iterations, fn's or function nodes passes the message uh, passes messages to vn's and vice versa. These messages are used to remove the inter-user interference in the signal. And, then, and the parameter we can control here is the number of MPA decoding iteration, which is this n iter. And we will show later that as we increase n iter, we can improve the, uh, the error performance. But that is the, the increase is negligible for highest. 
So for the simulation results, uh, the impact of bandwidth compression factor and number of MP iterations were investigated. So the values of BCF is 0 0.6 and 0 0.8, and for the MPA decoding iterations, it's 3 and 10. And the performance of the proposed scheme was compared to that of the conventional S, uh, sparse code multiple access. And then these are the following system parameters, LS equal to 16 SEMA groups, J is equal to 6 users per SEMA groups, M two bits is equal to 2 bits per symbol, and is 4 subcarriers per SEMA groups, Pro is equal to 2, and the SEME code book used was obtained from this paper. Then, from the figure, it can be seen that the lower BCF, uh, bandwidth compression setting, achieved lower bit error probability. And this can be attributed to the um, higher level of decoding introduced to maintain the same spectral efficiency. And the drawback, however, is that increased uh, in lowering the BCF increases the computational complexity because since lower BCF, but we need to maintain the uh, same bandwidth, so we're introducing more subcarriers and hence larger DFT, uh, DFT size and dimensions of interests for the pre-coding and uh, uh, for the uh, increasing the complexity of matrix vector multiplication. And then finally, for the effect of the MPA iterations, Increasing the decoding iterations improved the error performance as seen here. However, the improvements become uh, the improvement become negligible at high SNR per. And to summarize, uh, we've, I've implemented a multi-user transmission scheme combining SEMA and pre-coded SEFDM in the simulation. I've observed how we also observe how different system parameters affect the BR performance of the transmission scheme. And we've observed that for fixed data rate and bandwidth, proposed scheme achieved better performance than conventional SEMA. The drawback, however, is that there, there is an increased computational complexity. And for future work, we can investigate the performance considering the timing and carrier offset, as well as practical hardware implementation of this proposed transmission scheme. So that's all, and thank you for it. in black. So, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mark Dalampas, and I'm here to uh, give this uh, talk uh, titled An Enhanced uh, Geometric Filter Algorithm with channel diversity for device free localization, and this is for the uh, Pantaring Gervasio Prof Professorial Chair Award. So, um, essentially this uh, answers the question, uh, can we track a person's location without the cooperation, without his cooperation, by only using this effect on the, envir on the environment's uh, RF links? And the answer to that is yes. So it's shown here that if a person is inside this uh, environment with wireless links uh, traversing it, uh, he has a certain effect on, on the RSS of those links, 
which enables us to determine where he is inside that room without him knowing. Okay, so this uh, so-called uh, device free localization technology is envisioned to enrich many important applications, for example, uh, assisted living and uh, e-health, uh, security and surveillance, and uh, finally, uh, tactical response. So, for example, uh, um, DFL using radio waves uh, has um, advantages over systems such as uh, uh, video cameras in such a way that RF can go through uh, certain walls or through smoke, uh, wherein uh, video cameras or optical-based methods will, uh, will not work at all. Okay, so due to the promising applications of DFL, a number of uh, RSS-based or received signal strength-based uh, DFL algorithms have been proposed. So some of these include uh, geometric methods, essentially uh, by um, finding out which of the links inside that network are affected by the person's uh, presence and finding the intersection of those links, those are probable uh, locations of that person. And uh, another uh, method for DFL is uh, radio tomographic imaging. Essentially, the problem is posed as an uh, image reconstruction problem. So we can think of the network as a, some, some sort of camera for, for, for the deployment area. And in this uh, picture, the, the area in red uh, is uh, the most likely location of the uh, person. And finally, there have been some work on uh, statistical inversion methods, for example, particle filters, um, wherein uh, the effect of a person on the link uh, is modeled uh, probabilistically. Okay, so um, previously, uh, actually last year, I already presented the geometric filter algorithm. And uh, this algorithm outperforms some of these existing methods in terms of both uh, execution time and accuracy. So essentially, it's a geometric method, but with additional uh, locational filtering, okay? So the existing geometric uh, methods, they are sensitive to outliers. Uh, they apply no filtering. The RTI, or radio tomographic imaging methods, require a fine grid to achieve a good uh, point estimate of the location. And uh, Due to this uh, fine grid, uh, there's a large number of operations required. And uh, particle filter or statistical inversion approaches usually need a high number of particles and uh, complex models to model the effect of the person on the link. So what we write out is some sort of um, a vision of filtering with the geometric methods to achieve uh, advantages in execution time and accuracy. So the problem essentially is, uh, how do we locate a single E1 target inside the deployment region and perimeter position? So this is a typical setup for a DFL network. So you have nodes in the perimeter, and they cover, um, in this case, an eight by eight meter area. So essentially, we can locate this target with knowledge of uh, the, the current vector of RSS measurements, R of T a baseline RSS vector, and the locations of the end nodes. We assume that all nodes within a, are within radio range of each other and are complainer with the target. So the geometric filter algorithm essentially um, uses that information to generate a location estimates. For example, in the upper left figure, um, say that, that is the, those are the detected uh, links affected by uh, the person's presence. So the blue, uh, the blue segments are the target affected links, and then due to noise or some interference, uh, we can detect some outlier links, essentially links that have uh, changes in their RSS but not due to the presence of the target. The circular uh, uh, region is a prior region that we defined from previous location estimates, essentially to, to rule out those outlier links. So in uh, this middle figure on the top, we have those outlier links removed, and using the existing uh, or using the remaining links, we solve for their intersections, and we arrive at potential uh, target locations or point estimates of the target location. Finally, any um, well, not finally, well, any point outside that prior region is removed, and we fuse those remaining points using a combination of uh, distance space weights and uh, RSS space weights to, to arrive at a single location estimate. So this is the geometric filter algorithm approach. 
And uh, we tested this in both uh, outdoor and indoor environments uh, under these conditions. So since the indoor scene is uh, a bit cluttered, we used more uh, nodes to run this experiment. We implemented a calibration period of 90 seconds wherein there was no person inside the area. So we, this was uh, the amount of time we took to uh, measure the baseline RSS. And we uh, performed this number of trials with the target walking at a velocity of around uh, half a meter per second. So these experiments resulted in uh, um, pretty good uh, accuracy, given that uh, the person we're tracking is not equipped with any any radio transceiver, so we're just relying on his effect on the links. So for the indoor cluttered environment, uh, the geometric filter algorithm was able to achieve uh, some meter accuracy, and we compared it with uh, uh, a Bayesian grid approach, a radio tomographic imaging approach, and a particle filter based approach. Um, and in this uh, result note that the accuracy of the geometric filter algorithm um, is nearly equal to that achieved by the particle filter based approach but at a lower uh, computational cost. So how do we improve further this uh, algorithm? And this is the main topic of uh, what I'll be talking about today. Essentially what we do is we exploit the uh, we use multiple, uh, we use RSS measurements across multiple channels. Okay, so essentially, the area within which a target has an effect on a link depends on the link's uh, static fade level. So in this uh, plot, what, what they found out was that uh, across different channels, at around uh, this uh, sample number, a person crossed the link line. And we see that the effect of that person crossing the link line is different for these three channels. So for channels A and B, um, actually more for channel A, the, the person crossing the link line caused a severe drop in the RSS. However, for channel C, wherein they classified it as a uh, deep fade channel, we see that the variation of the RSS doesn't really capture or doesn't really illustrate where or at which point in time uh, the person crossed the link line. So we can classify links into two, anti-fade and defade links, and um, this is an illustration of um, the area inside which a person may have an effect on the RSS of those links. So for anti-fade links, uh, the ellipse is narrower, so they provide, once, you, once an anti-fade link has a, um, severe changes in RSS, we know for sure, or we know with more certainty, that the person crossed that line. However, for deep fade links, if the person is located, say, around this edge, he will still have an effect on the link, uh, on the link RSS, even though he did not cross the link line. So it's less informative and less useful for uh, localization. However, uh, that does, does not say that's not useful at all because you, you can use deep fade links for motion detection. So the, the multi-channel uh, geometric filter algorithm improves uh, the GF algorithm by incorporating the fade level information in different stages. So during calibration, we uh, also estimate the fade levels and link variances, and we use those fade levels in succeeding stages of the algorithm. For example, in uh, determining link-specific thresholds, a rank filtering of uh, links, and generating a fade level-based weights for the point estimate of uh, the target's location. So we estimate the, um, since there's noise present, uh, we cannot uh, actually, okay. Um, since uh, due, to, due to noise, we can't have a, we can't have an accurate estimate of the fade levels. So what we do is estimate the fade level by taking it as a difference between the baseline RSS and the RSS predicted by, say, the long distance path loss model. So in this case, um, channels with large uh, positive values of F bar are preferred since we assume that those are the anti-fade channels. So in this example, the blue links or the blue lights refer to uh, channels in anti-fade while the red, red lights refer to channels in Deep fade. Okay. 
So for the link specific detection thresholds, uh, essentially we just uh, estimate the variance in the link during the uh, calibration process and use that uh, to set uh, link specific uh, detection thresholds. In the previous version of the algorithm, we just used a single value and, uh, for the threshold for detection. And uh, we take the mean absolute difference in RSS across all channels and weighted by the uh, weighted by the fade levels to build a set of target effect links. And then we just select the top uh, fee, percent, uh, fee percent of those links uh, to use for localization. And we proceed as before, um, similar to how the GF algorithm arrives at the point estimate but, but again, the multi-channel uh, geometric filter algorithm uses the fade levels to assign uh, additional weights. So essentially, uh, higher weights are assigned to possible locations that have uh, that belong to links intersecting with the high overall fade levels. And finally, um, the location estimates generated via weighted sum of those uh, probable target locations. And again, different from the uh, the GF algorithm. In this version, we use the fade levels as an additional weight for those uh, point estimates. So the MCGF algorithm uh, was evaluated in both uh, outdoor and indoor environments. So once again, uh, for the indoor environment, this is similar to the environment uh, wherein we tested the uh, GF algorithm using almost the same uh, number of trials and uh, same number of nodes. And we used the three different channels for the links. So we see here that um, this algorithm tracks a target well in both scenes. So for the outdoor scene, we have a tracking error of around half a meter. And for the inner scene, we have a tracking error of around three fourths of a meter. And um, we compare the performance of this algorithm with other algorithms that use uh, either um, a multi-channel approach, uh, these two, and a single channel approach, such as these three, okay? So MCGF is the multi-channel geometric filter. Uh, MCGFA, instead of um, weighting, uh, you, um, weighting the estimates by the fade levels, we just simply take the average across the different channels. MCGKF, this doesn't perform any uh, locational filtering, but, but uh, it performs Kalman filtering of the point estimates. These three apply the original uh, GF algorithm using measurements from channel 11, channel 18, and channel 26. And these two refer to um, a multi-channel version of uh, radio tomographic imaging using the averaged version of the link RSS and a fade level weighted version of the link RSS. Okay, so we see that uh, for scene two, the cluttered inner scene, the MCGF algorithm perform, outperforms these uh, other algorithms achieving sub-meter accuracy. So to conclude, um, we've developed fast and accurate EFL algorithms based on the geometric methods. So we've shown that locational filters and distance-dependent weights greatly improve the accuracy of existing geometric methods. And furthermore, by using uh, channel diversity and employing uh, fade level based weights, we've shown that we can achieve better accuracy for the geometric filter algorithm. So some future work, um, these are some uh, questions that need to be asked and need to be uh, worked on. So first is, uh, for, for the previous algorithms, what we did was just track a single target. But how do we track uh, multiple people efficiently? Or what are the features of the RF link can we exploit to uh, improve accuracy? And another question is that how do we reduce the number of RF links without sacrificing accuracy? So for these methods, uh, the geometric filter methods, RDI, um, statistical inversion methods, they rely on a dense uh, collection of nodes uh, in order to achieve a certain level of accuracy. But of course, the question is, can you achieve the same accuracy uh, by using, even uh, by using the, uh, a lower number of nodes? And finally, um, the existing methods use a calibration period to essentially measure the baseline RSS uh, during a time when the, when the person is not present in the room. 
but it would be very useful if we have a system uh, learn the link specific uh, model parameters on the fly without offline calibration. So to close, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the Mataring uh, Gervasio uh, Professorial Chair Award, our sponsor for this award, and, find, and of course the Engineering Research and Development Technology Program, which funded my uh, studies uh, during which I did this work. So thank you very much. Questions? So, after, so I'll be presenting a vehicle classification systems for traffic monitoring in the, in the Philippines uh, for the Concepcion Hidalgo San the Modern Foundation Professor LJ. So the outline of the presentations will be as follows. I will discuss a few motivations and background why we did this study. Uh, some introductions how to classify vehicles in the video the proposed framework, experimental setup, results, and conclusion. So for some motivations before I begin, it was reported by a Japanese agency, I think JICA, back in 2011 that used about $40 million in revenue in terms of productivity because of traffic conditions. So this, this was way back in. 2011, 2010, so that's how much revenue we're using in terms of people productivity. People are stuck in traffic rather than doing something productive themselves. And according to Waze Global Drivers Index, uh, Metro Manila is one of the worst cities to drive in. I think they reported this very well in 2015 and 2017. So this is 2016. Uh, this is a score of 1 to 10. Philippines is about, about 3.13. Uh, and this is, these are one of the worst cities to drive in, so those are the relative score. And the uh, worst urban areas to drive up, Cebu was about 1.15. That, that would be, the highest would be 8.81, 7.54. So that's based on the Waze uh, Driver Satisfaction Index. So on, I looked at the data for 2018 just to check how, how good we are. So based on 20 ways specific data, this is, we are at 3.7. So we were at 3.9 in 2015, we are now at 3.7, Metro Manila. Cebu is still at, uh, I think, 1.1. So 1.15 channel 2016, <laughs> so it's 1.1. Uh, we did not do any better in terms of driver satisfaction. This is based on the 2018 uh, driver satisfaction index. It covers, uh, this, these are global ranking. This is the traffic, safety, driver service, and uh, socioeconomic. Those are just the metrics that are being used by we. So that's that's our status for now in terms of uh, driver satisfaction index. Okay, so we have very bad uh, driving road conditions, especially Cebu. <laughs> okay, so if you're in Cebu, can imagine driving in Cebu. Uh, the possible solutions, one would be to implement some sort of intelligent uh, transport systems that we call ITS. So those are a collection of systems or softwares that would help us somehow mitigate the problems that we have with our traffic system. So an example would be such system that would automatically track uh, the trajectory of the cars as they are being, uh, as they are seen on the camera view. Uh, a system to compute uh, traffic uh, road occupancy, lane occupancy, the, num the number of roads, uh, car vehicles that have crossed this line, and somehow a measure of, based on visual systems, we can somehow estimate the velocity of the, uh, the vehicle entering the, 
and uh, region, of, uh, region of interest. So those are some of the solutions that you want to implement. Okay, tracking, computing the velocity, and lane occupancy. We are interested in solving the problem how to classify the vehicles. This is a very interesting problem, especially in the Philippine settings. So, uh, the analysis of the vehicles, why we need to classify the vehicles. It will help us aid in intelligent transport systems, especially if we can identify emergency response vehicles like ambulance, police cars, police motorcycles, and it would somehow, we could, if we could uh, program the traffic light to respond to emergency response vehicles, that would be a very good, uh, uh, that would be we have a very good effect on our traffic system. For environmental impact assessment, that's also interesting what would be the effect of the trucks and buses on our uh, pollution. Uh, we, it would enable us to enforce traffic regulations. It could enforce dedicated motorcycle and bus lanes. It could track whether vehicle truck bans are there, if you are to implement truck bans, etc. Et so there, there may be a lot of potential benefits if we could just classify the vehicles based on uh, the vision systems. So our roads are kind of interesting that we have a lot of classes. So we experimented with a lot of Seven. We settled for about seven, but these are not just the these are not the road the, the kind of vehicles that we see on our roads. So we see jeep na mukhang bus, owner na mukhang jeep, so a lot of other uh, types of car. But we settled on seven. Okay, so small vehicles, sedan types, SUV, jeepneys, trucks, and buses. Yeah. So how to go about with the classification? We use the traditional method of background subtraction. It means that we model the background using previous and current frames to detect the foreground object. So using a current frame and a current model of the background, we're able to detect foreground objects which would uh, correspond to the vehicles. So we first implemented a vehicle detection scheme. And then to classify, we had a feature extraction, a combination of contours or geometric features and uh, texture features, so that would be mean, variance, skewness of the objects that are there. <coughs> we also use a combination of shape features, uh, normalized by position. So a vehicle further from the region of uh, interest would have a smaller scale than the figure that is a vehicle that is nearer the camera. So the features are scaled. Okay. So to classify, we select only the best distinguishing features, and then we classify the models based on several classification methods. The k nearest neighbor methods, part vector machines, and the multi-layer perceptron. So this equivalent to a neural network with a single hidden layer. After doing a lot of things, our first iteration at vehicle classification, we had a classification rate of about 60 to 70 percent for all the seven classes, which is not very good, so we devised our scheme. We implemented a two-step classification system where we try to estimate the vehicle size. And then if we have a good SL200, it's a medium or small size vehicles, then we later can classify those two as either one of the four types and one of the three types. So it's like a small, medium, large vehicle classifier, and then classify the other stuff. So it's a two-step classification schemes. The experimental setup, we have a vehicle image data set. There are, uh, the image video is 640 by 360 at five frames per second, this is a subsample. The video was taken at two separate locations. One is, I think, at Commonwealth Avenue, just mga overpass doon. So, you would see some students holding video camera there, but taga DSP na yun. And another sa Katipunan area, may overpass doon right before Miriam or Ateneo. We also got uh, video there. So the video is divided into a trading set and a validation set. Hopefully, we have a balanced number of classes for each. And for the experimental setup, we have a set of features, uh, geometric and texture features. We did some optimization on which set of features would best allow us to classify, depending on the classifiers that we use. So we used some mix and match of those features. Uh, we used a, a, an algorithm, a relief algorithm, to allow us to optimize the number of features and a, a number of classification schemes. KNN, SVMs, and MLP with backpropagation and several other functions. 
Now, to evaluate the experimental setup, we use the uh, precision and recall parameter, parameter and then a seven-fold cross-validation scheme. So the video that you use for uh, training is actually repeated or iterated seven-fold so that we have a good average performance. Okay. In terms of results, based on vehicle size, um, a motorcycle, a vehicle, and a large vehicle, we have this confusion matrix. We are fairly good with a few errors in classifying small, medium, and large vehicles. In terms of classifying the medium and the large vehicles, we have, again, the confusion matrix. I think for the medium-sized vehicles, the best classifier was the SVM, and for the large vehicle, the best classifier would be the MLP, the multi-layer perception. So a different classifier works for a different class of vehicles. It's a different classifier for the medium class, it's a different classifier for the large class. So when we try to cascade the two classifiers, so the first step, you try to classify small, medium, large, and then the next step, try to classify the other four. We have the following two-step classifier confusion matrix for all the seven types. So that's more or less, if you have a good number of diagonals, then more or less the performance of the classifier is, is good. And the results of the summaries that for the size classifier of the number of classifiers is three, can and produce the best results for a medium classifier which of the classifier the SVM produced the best results for the large physical classifier, we have the MLP for the uh, best results. So there's no one classifier that can actually be used to, mod, uh, to classify all the four uh, distinguishing classes. So we used a mix of those classifiers. Comparing what we have done with the others that we have found in literature, those that have the same number of classes, let's say they classified seven classes, a two-step KNN reference number six is at 89%. What we did was that we are at about 91%. And we are actually comparable to other classifiers that have the less number of classes. So the more class you have, the more difficult would be the class of the classifier. But then we, we are more or less comparable with, with what has been reported in literature for less number of classes. So in summary, a two-step classification scheme has been implemented effective for classifying several legal classes beyond the typical size classification. And the choice of the classifier model, as well as features important for optimizing system performance. Uh, our future works, we have to apply some more optimizations. You have to investigate. We have not yet used any deep learning architecture for this. But we want to benchmark what would be the best that you can get based on the classical techniques that you can get out of what is already known and implemented. And another one would be to investigate how such high computation architectures would work based on our, uh, based on what we have so far. Uh, we have been uh, used different camera orientations, different ambient lightings, maulan ba, traffic, mainit, etc. cetera, gabi. So those are, those different things. Uh, not yet been investing. Those are the more difficult uh, challenges that we want to work on. But we want, just want to be benchmark what we, what we have at uh, fairly good conditions. So this is a demonstration of what we have so far. This is what you will see. I think this is uh, one of common what you have to submit about the So this is a demonstration of how the classifier would work. It would enter a region of, uh, uh, region of interest and it would like to classify uh, the vehicles as it comes along. So, may mga error dun sa detection. <laughs> okay. So, hindi na detect yung patterns of traction. So, okay. Pero dun sa mga na-detect niya, naka-classify ka ng tama. So, this is how, how, may mga na-miss. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, rock the class. <laughs> you would imagine how difficult this is going to be. So, we're not yet 100%, but uh, we are fairly good at, uh, this is running, I think, at real-time performance of the classifier. So, yeah, so that's it for what I have for today. I would like to acknowledge uh, some folks, the, the, some students, and some students would need to annotate all of those video data that we have, so we have to give them credit for doing those work, and the Sandoval family for their continued support of our research. So 
Thank you very much. That is all that I have. Questions? I don't want to ask all this. Can I have a question? Any questions? Yes, sir. Ah, currently, ang ginawa nang namin sa laptop. So the computation of the laptop is what currently limits us for this case. Kaya the video is at five frames per second. But a more computing that we have, we could we could fairly do thirty frames per second if our computing allows us. So ano naman siya? Per frame naman ginagawa. So the limit is how fast you can compute per frame, technically. So thank you for your questions. Good afternoon. Okay, so good afternoon. Uh, thank you for coming. <laughs> and uh, so I'll talk about uh, well, oversampling in energy detection receivers, but really it's about trying to figure out what to do with okay, energy if you have very little of it. Okay. So again, I'm Louis Alarcon. So, <laughs> this is <laughs> so excited to get here. So, but this is this is really work by my student and now faculty, Mr. Santos. And it's, you know, he did most of the work. I just you know what I do. <laughs> okay. So, one of the things, uh, just to put this in context, okay, I will tip on this wire at some point. So, just to put this in context, so what we're working on are. Okay, this whole area of energy starved systems, right? What happens if you do have very little energy? So obviously because you're harvesting in the environment, you have to save up on this energy. But the other interesting question is what happens if you do get energy? What do you do with that? Okay. So do you do, let's say, communications? Do you do, you do sensing? Do you do... But it turns out you need to do all of that. Okay. So maybe let's try to look at a few of the blocks okay, in this particular talk who we'll look at communications, specifically the radio RF communications, and see okay, if I do have the capability to you know, fudge around with energy, can I use more energy, can I use a bit less, then what can we do? Well, first of all, it turns out that where do we actually spend the energy? Okay, so we spend energy just by, uh, let's look at this, in an energy detection receiver. Oh, this is still on, I guess. So it's probably one of the simplest receivers that you'll see. The only thing that you need to do is pretty much just figure out if there is energy in your channel. Okay? And if there's energy, it's a one. If there's no energy, it's a zero. Now, one of the things that you will spend energy on is to make sure you do get a certain bit error rate. Sorry about that. I, I can't give this. So, if you have, you know, if you want a certain bit error rate, and that means you A, have a certain input error rate, and B, you have a certain noise figure that your circuit is a, adding, or a certain noise that your circuit is adding. So, what we did, when I say we, that's 99% Cheeto, right? <laughs> uh, is figure out, okay, if you know, I'm spending energy just okay, to make sure I have correct communications, what causes it to be incorrect? Well, there's, you know, in this particular case, very simply, you know, we use energy detection and the standard Manchester encoding, right? So you, you use Manchester encoding to make sure 
you're not spending energy at DC, right? So you want the average of the whole thing. So you always will have transitions, and that's where we sort of start, right? So you make errors when you miss a transition, or you actually detect a transition that wasn't there in the first place. Now, uh, well, Chita has been working on this for quite some time. That's, yeah, that's I know, the, the, he does have a very good paper intensive. So yeah, so th this is one of the things that resulted from that. And it's, okay, where are those errors coming from? What, what, what would cause your receiver to make errors? So one of the big blocks of, let's say, an energy detection circuit is the majority block, right? So let's go through very quickly what that means. Okay, your, your, your front end okay, tries to basically get the energy. It's the envelope of the mean square. Okay, and then after that, you start, start sampling. And you know, the more you oversample, right, the more ones or zeros you get. And then you do have a lot of samples. If there's more ones than zeros, you figure out that that's a one. If there's more zeros than ones, you do the other thing. Now. It turns out that it's very easy to make mistakes if, obviously, your noise is very high. But with this, you know, in the majority of votes, it's sort of, you can put in a lot of intelligence, right? You can have statuses, you can have adaptive thresholds, because it's all going to be digital. So it turns out you spend energy for this. And Chito, you know, nicely outlined what happens in a paper. Now, it turns out that you also will spend most of your energy trying to get your Manchester decoder to work. Specifically, one of the most energy consuming components is what okay, Mark uh, mentioned earlier, synchronization, right? How to make sure your sort of clocks are aligned and the accuracy of those clocks, the less drift, all of those things cost energy, okay? cost energy. So she said, okay, we can look at a lot of these things. And okay, it turns out that one, or, you know, the two most common, <coughs> if you do random okay, testing okay, over hundreds or hundreds of thousands of samples and so on, you get this particular distribution. Most of the errors are coming from one, okay, uh, Incorrect transitions for on the uh, at the output of the Manchester or at the output of the majority vote, and the second is if the symbols start becoming very short, right? Because you have a lot of energy in the channel. Energy means there's a lot of other things, noise, okay, interference in your channel before it gets to your LNA. So. With this in mind, so you can simulate this and um, okay, get your results and try that. But what we did here is, can we model this? And can we model this very accurately? And actually, the whole <coughs> model and everything, you can look at it in the paper, but that was basically Cheetos thesis. So one of the results that you can get out of this model is one figure out, so the, these are okay, the, the generated curves from the model. You can figure out, right? You can figure out, okay, as I increase or decrease my input noise, the noise in the signal before your radio, okay? And I plot that with, let's say, the oversampling ratio of my majority vote or my energy detection circuit. And obviously I get this interesting curve where okay, I can actually achieve the same bit error rate for different oversampling ratios, okay? depending on how much noise you have at your input. So what does that mean? It means that I can achieve, let's say, okay, that one e to the minus three level with n equals five, okay, with 10, 15, 20, but 
Okay, it depends now on how much errors or how much noise do I have at the input. What's my SNR at the input? Now, that means, okay, can I just choose randomly here or can I actually do better? Well, if you look at, if you fix your, if you fix your sampling ratio, or your oversampling ratio, then okay, you're probably going to be optimal for one noise or one SNR the input, but it's not going to be optimal for anything else, right? And this is where this whole energy thing comes in. So if you do have the opportunity to save energy, you probably want to do that. And what, well, one of the main results here is that really. We're playing with this okay, device noise versus device or circuit energy. So in, in the end, when you start increasing oversampling ratio, what you're doing is you're burning a lot of power in digital. Okay. But the good thing is that you're saving power in analog. So at some point, we like those things because there's going to be an optimum. And it turns out that there is. One of the things okay. one of the things that we looked at is okay, you can now start plotting these are simulations that if you if you change your oversampling ratio for a certain SNR the input, you actually will get okay, your global minima for the receiver. Okay. Now, why is this so why are we sort of excited about this result? We're really excited about this again, because of the fact that if I do have the opportunity, the signals are you know, very nice, clean, very little interference, I can back off energy. So it means if I'm harvesting, then I can just save energy for some other thing. But if the device or you know, the signals are noisy, I can actually have the option to put in a lot, a little more energy and I can figure out, okay, what bit error rate will I end up with? Okay. And if I want better, so I can just add a bit more energy. So what we're trying to you know, show here is that instead of having a zero, one type thing where there's, I get this SNR, then I get something. If I have something less, then I get nothing. So we will actually want to do that slider and how much energy, okay, or in this particular topic, it was the optimum amount of energy to get this incremental improvement. Okay? Now, the whole system, so this is part of, again, of a very big system. So now the intelligence of that system can now start playing around with all of the components, right? So you do this for the radio, but there's nothing stopping you from doing this for the ADC. There's nothing stopping you from doing this for your regulators and so on, so forth, which is what we actually did. So now you get very, very fine-grained, very, very intelligent application of resiliency by, probably guess it, just the correct application of where to use that energy. So this is, this is something that I just wanted to share. Okay. Oh, I'm just looking at the clock. I, don't, you know, I think I was given this. Oh, actually good. So, so this is pretty much what I wanted to share without tripping over this wire. And then if you have any questions, then okay, please be, feel free to ask them. And I just want to thank you for hanging around, sticking around. And okay, definitely want to thank EDI for their support. Okay, do I see sure for uh, the tape outs? Okay. Martin Lab faculty, students, and staff, and you guys again, thank you very much, and get up to you. Yes. Okay. Using our graph here, so we'll see if you can speak to the model of the model and and the model of the model. Is that if you remember any of them? How broad is that? Yes, and that's actually a good question. This is so one of the things that okay, is a, one of the cool characteristics of this model is the model is statistical. So it's a statistical model. So what we're dealing with are variances, means okay, for all these uh, components, and definitely that includes PBD. So for example, jitter, jitter is a product of PBD and application.
is our offset. Okay, so they're all in the model, and it turns out that yes, that the if you look at the optimal was in the previous slide. Okay? So you do get okay, uh, it's relatively flat for very clean signals, but the energy you need, okay. And because this is obviously you know, the x-axis is exponential, so the, as your uh, input noise exponentially grows, your power, the power that you need to mitigate that grows exponentially. Okay. Obviously, you have an asymptote okay, around 0.5 because at that noise level, you pretty much have okay, everything is error. Right? So no amount of oversampling can save you there. So you do, you see, you get this, you do get this uh, trade-off curve. Okay? It is pretty steep when you have very high noise, right? and that sort of gives you an idea that that's probably not where you want to be. Right? So you want to be somewhere where, okay, in the linear, or that when your slopes are approximately one. Right? So that means this amount of energy will buy me this amount of uh, error rate, but it's not disproportional, right? I need 10 times the energy to buy me 0.1%, right? So this sort of graph shows, okay, you can do this, okay? Uh, the, so I sort of did not put in a lot of the circuit-specific uh, parameters, but yes, this particular, uh, oversampling ratio versus energy means sort of a reference. So this is, I think, n equals 10 is around 20 megahertz. Okay. And then you get this particular curve. Right. So this uh, curves here are for <coughs> n equals 10. You would imagine that if your error rates are different, you get different uh, total energies and you get different minima. And all the minimas are in this particular table. So if you change your input error rate, then if you can change your sampling rate or oversampling ratio as well, then you will always work at minimum energy. Okay. But you can, again, because we have this error rate, you know that, okay, maybe I can back off. If I can live with more errors, then I can back off the energy. Or if I want very accurate measurements or very accurate communications, then I, I'll just add a bit more energy. Okay, so this is sort of what the whole you know context of this talk is. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? There's an exam. <laughs> okay, so if there are no questions, thank you very much.